if we take Earth as the point of reference and try to observe the planets rotating around the Sun, this would be the sequence of the orbits that we would be encountering. And as per Hindu astronomy, these are the nine planets that are considered as part of the solar system for various theological purposes. And with the 12 constellations in the outer space as the frame of reference, the planetary positions are computed. And especially the Sun's position with reference to these 12 constellations in the outer space are the reason why 12 months are computed. And of these 12, when Sun transits to the constellation Libra, that's when Diwali is marked. Not just this one, almost every Hindu festival that is celebrated in Bharat has a reference to an astronomical event and is inherently connected to the time of the year that we are living in. One of the most beautiful aspects of the culture of Bharat is the festivals that we have. There are a lot of them and Diwali is one of the most auspicious and important festival. It's generally marked in five days. And of course, there are a lot of cultural diversities with respect to Diwali. Different parts of India celebrate different reasons, but broadly, these are the five days. The first day is Dhanteras, marking the birth of Lord Dhanvantari. The second day is Naraka Chaturdasi, celebrating the death of Narakasura. The third day is Diwali, celebrated with Lakshmi Puja on on the occasion of the birth of Sri Mahalakshmi. And the fourth day is Gordhan Puja, celebrated in the name of Lord Sri Krishna. And the fifth day is Bhaiduj, a very special celebration of a bonding between a brother and a sister. This is a very vibrant time of the year in Bharat. And today, I'd like to tell you a short story about the first festival of these five, Dhanteras. According to Bhagavata Purana, a very important event, the Kshira Sagar Madhanam, is elaborated with great detail. And to this event is where the roots of Diwali will be traced. The birth of Sri Mahalakshmi out of Kshira Sagar. And then eventually, the birth of Bhagavan Dhanvantari as well. In Bhagavata Puranam, quite a great detail about Dhanvantari is quoted. It is not just Bhagavata Puranam, but also in Sri Ramayanam, we have this event of Kshira Sagar Madhanam and the birth of Dhanvantari is detailed out by Valmiki Maharshi to Rama and Lakshmana. And this is one of the earliest references where Dhanvantari is quoted as the Adi Purush for Ayurveda, the branch of science that deals with life sciences and medicine. And if we get to the crux of the topic, Bhagavan Sri Mahavishnu, picking up the incarnation as Dhanvantari, narrates Ayurvedam to Sushruta Maharshi and few others. And Sushruta Maharshi compiles all the teachings of Dhanvantari to him in a very ancient scripture which we call today as Sushruta Samhita. And the best thing with this one is, it is extremely well preserved. Since generations, this Sushruta Samhita is intact and is being passed down since many millennia. Sushruta Samhita forms the cornerstone for Ayurvedam. And this is the main reason why Dhanteras has a very strong and inherent connection with Ayurvedam as the humanity got to explore a very important branch of science, the life sciences and medicine. Ayurvedam is a very complex branch of knowledge, but if we try to take a big picture of the highly condensed view of Ayurvedam, this is how it looks like. And this is how Dhanvantari narrated to Sushruta. There are eight specializations in life sciences and medicine. Bala Chikitsa, Rasayana Chikitsa, Vajikarana, Visha, Graha, Kaya, Shalakya and Shalya Chikitsas. These are the specializations which are stacked up vertically. And for each of the specialization, there are instructions and procedures. So basically training them, training the physicians in these eight specializations. There are five categories of instructions and procedures. They are Sutra, Nidana, Sharira, Chikitsa and Kalpa. So this matrix what you're seeing here completely forms the big picture of Ayurveda. In fact, it is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, scripture available on life sciences and medicine across the world. So well structured and so well preserved. If we try to take a deeper look into the specializations, the eight of them, starting with the top, Shalya Chikitsa. These are methods and procedures on surgery and design of the surgical tools. The second one is Shalakya Chikitsa, deals with the ear, nose, throat and oral and dental related ailments. And the third one is Kaya Chikitsa, deals with treating general and seasonal ailments. And the fourth one is Graha Chikitsa, deals with treating traumatic and psychological complaints. And the next one is Visha Chikitsa, administering antidotal treatment for poison inflictions. And the sixth one is Vaji Karana Chikitsa, treating infertility and other aphrodisiac complaints. The last but one is Rasayana Chikitsa, deals with preparing and administering rejuvenating therapies, the massage and all that stuff. And the last one is Bala Chikitsa, it's the pediatrics, treating infants and children in their ailments. So these are different specializations as per Ayurveda and as per Sushiruta Samhita. In fact, not just Sushiruta Samhita, almost all the Ayurvedic scriptures align to this framework because that's how it was narrated by Dhanvantri to Sushiruta and eventually it was passed down. 
and then if we take a deeper look into the instructions and procedures for each of those eight specializations there are five corresponding training methods and procedures and other instructions how it needs to be practiced starting from the bottom the first set of instructions are sutra these are the general instructions on common procedures for physicians and training and the second one is nidana instructions on decoding the symptoms and diagnosing the cause of ailments and the third one is sharira instructions on explaining the anatomy of the human body to the mind in this level and the fourth one is chikitsa instructions on identifying the plants formulas of preparing medicine and storage of the medicine and administering them and the fifth one is kalpa these are the instructions on analyzing the impact of the inflicted poison and other infections on human body and according to sushruta samhita and many other ancient ayurvedic scriptures it's not a matter of choice every physician who practices ayurvedam should be well versed and excel in all these eight specializations going through all these five set of instructions so the complete compendium of these instructions have to be well mastered by anybody who is practicing or administering ayurvedic treatments so that's what sushruta samhita says giving a complete and holistic understanding of the human body condition and treating and administering the ayurvedic medicines and treatments sharire jarjari bhute vyadigraste kale bare aushadam jahnavi toyam vaidyo narayano harihi the translation is when the human body is suffering with diseases medicine is like the sacred water of the river ganga and the doctor is narayana or the god himself the reason i'm quoting this verse is besides the fact that ayurvedam is one of the oldest well structured and well preserved form of understanding the life sciences and medicine it is also very high in ethics and morals and values i don't know if any other civilization has this level of reverence and respect and regard towards the doctor because in this culture a doctor is treated as equal as the god and there is a very important reason why i'm bringing this up take a very good look at this symbol does it ring any bell do you remember seeing the symbol somewhere take a pause and try to recollect that is the logo of the world medical association and this logo is the one of world health organization and the third one is the logo of indian medical association If you see one thing very common in all these three logos of these medical bodies is a snake coiled to a staff. You know what it represents? It's about Asclepius. In the Greek pantheon, Asclepius is a Greek god responsible for health, healing and medicine. And the last time that you would have seen this symbol was probably on an ambulance or on the prescription head of your physician or anywhere in a hospital. So this symbol is globally adopted as a symbol of healthcare. And from this point onwards, Do watch this video only if you can put aside your religious and political biases. If not, then this video is no longer for you. You can stop watching right here. Now let me put forward my thoughts very clearly without absolutely no room for perception whatsoever. I am not at all criticizing anything here. Neither I am disrespecting any of the bodies which I was just mentioning about, especially the Indian Medical Association and we have very high regards for them. And the reason why you and me are happy and healthy today is because of the frontline workers and the healthcare workers right from an ambulance driver up until the chief specialist of a hospital. And that's the reason I quoted Vaidya Narayana Hari. That is the culture of Bharat. I'm not qualified to criticize anybody, but I'm curious to question. Now let me put my thoughts forward. First and very important thing there is absolutely no criticism towards asclepius or use of the rod of asclepius here you see in the statue there is a staff a staff with a coiled snake so that's what our or that's where actually the logo is derived from so which is very good we are aligned with the global trends and we would like to celebrate that's absolutely fine but my only question is why don't we celebrate ayurveda dhanvantari sushruta charaka vagbhata patanjali there are a lot of rishis and sages and saints who gave a lot of scriptures on ayurveda yet we don't hear anything about these great personalities anywhere in india especially in the medical communities and at the same time let me put forward a very important element to my thought as well I'm not talking about ayurveda from a clinical validity standpoint absolutely not it's purely from a historical and heritage standpoint it is something to celebrate right that's what gives the real identity of bharat let me tell you one very important thing as well 
neither asclepius nor sushruta nor patanjali none of these people invented the medicines that we are using today so there is no sense of attribution of the current scientific advancements to these personalities the reason asclepius is celebrated is only because of the heritage and that is the main source that the western world had to adopt so they adopted which is totally fine but then why don't we celebrate our great personalities who contributed greatly to the life sciences and medicine and for thousands of years ayurvedam has been the main source of life sciences and medicine here in this country so the bottom line is india celebrates asclepius which is good by adopting the symbol of the rod of asclepius into our medical community logo but then why not celebrate dhanvantari sushruta charaka vagbhata patanjali and centuries old and rich heritage of ayurvedam not for its clinical validities but for its history and heritage by the doctors and the healthcare workers in india let me know what do you think in the comments below but while doing so please do it respectfully because we are talking about the doctors because of which we are happy and healthy today end of the day vaidyo narayano harihi wishing you a happy and healthy dhanteras and as always thanks for watching